as you might have guessed, we are going to be talking about what it is to be a neighbor. Now, this word is a word that we use often, and we are all familiar with the word neighbor. But I do think that there is a possibility that we might be missing a rich and theological concept that is baked into the word neighbor. So if we look at what it means to be a good neighbor from the scriptures, we will probably come upon the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, the Good Samaritan is well known. It's a complex story, but it's also famous. How many of you have heard of a Good Samaritan hospital? Or a Good Samaritan ministry? Or even a church that's named the Good Samaritan Church? There are all these places that we see the name Good Samaritan. So as we go over this story, there are a couple questions that I want for all of you to consider. But speaking of questions, did you all know that in the Gospels, Jesus asks 300 questions about? Now that seems like a healthy amount, Did you know that Jesus is asked 200 questions? But this, this is the really interesting part. Jesus only directly answers three questions. So this makes me wonder, are the questions that we ask more important than the answers that we give? So going back to the story, The first question that Jesus is asked is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies with a question, as he often does. Jesus says, what is written in the law? And how do you read it? You will notice, often through the scriptures, that Jesus will answer a question with a question. Now, the expert in the law says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. This answer is given to the ex or this answer is given by the expert in the law, and it seems to be a direct reference to Matthew chapter twenty two, verse thirty seven. And in that verse, Jesus is asked, What is the greatest commandment? And his reply is, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So the next question asked by the expert in the law is, well then, who is my neighbor? A brief yet profound question. And I've noticed in the years that I've been working in ministry, I often talk about the neighbor. I ask questions like, how are we reaching our neighbors? Or I'll ask, are we as a church being a good neighbor? And there have been times where I've talked about these things, and someone in my committee will say, well, who are our neighbors? And this reminds me that there is complexity, that there is an implication to define who our neighbors are. So do our neighbors stop at the end of the street? Do our neighbors stop at the end of the township? Do our neighbors stop at the end of state lines? Do our neighbors stop at the edge of our borders? Do they stop overseas? Rabbi Jochum Prince has a famous quote that has been circulating for years, and he tries to answer who is our neighbor. He says, neighbor is not a geographic term. It is a moral concept. So when Jesus is asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds with a parable. So after Jesus shares this story, Jesus asks the expert in the law, which of these three 
do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell at the hands of the robbers? And the expert responds, it was the one who has mercy. And that was the Samaritan man. So I believe it is tremendously, tremendously important that we examine and figure out who the Samaritan man was and what it meant that he was a Samaritan. You see, in our modern context, there are less than a thousand Samaritans left in the world, and they are not on this side of the sea. So we don't have much to compare this to. So who were the Samaritans to the Israelites? The relationship between the Israelites and Samaritans was contentious. There were times in the Bible that just the label Samaritan was an insult. Both groups of people did not like each other, but this was not always the case. As is with many times in conflict, at one point the group was whole. The group was not divided. They were all under the Israelite people. But then a schism occurred. And when that schism happened, you then had the Samaritans and the Israelites. And when this happened, their religious traditions diverged as well. The Samaritans still had a Torah, their holy book, but it was different than the Israelite holy book in their Torah. They had a temple that they worshipped in, but it was not the same temple that they had worshipped in before that the ones that the Israelites worshipped in. They fought over land. They fought over the land that they once shared. And also, and this was a big one, when the Israelites were exiled by the Assyrians from their home, the Samaritans were allowed to stay. And then when the Israelites were allowed to come back to their home, the Samaritans tried to oppose them. They tried to stop them and say, no, this is our land now. So when the Samaritan man is presented as the example of a good neighbor, that came with it all of the conflict, all of the pain, and all of the division that both peoples had felt. The Samaritan was the other, and the Samaritan was the example of a good neighbor who should be left. So changing tones a little bit, who here loves your iPhones, your iMacs, iPads, all things Apple, I know Sue does, uh, who here loves your devices? Who here loves your PCs, your Kindles, Spotify, all things Microsoft? I mean, I know that's what I love. We do love our technology. And there are ways that our technology can connect us from vast distances. We can video call our loved ones regardless where they're at. We can look at cute pictures of our nieces and nephews, regardless where they live. With the invention of the internet, we are interconnected in instantaneous ways that allows for me to keep in touch with my friends Ruth and Ross who live in Scotland, even though it's been over 10 years since I've seen them. It allows for the church to have Zoom meetings and for all of you to stay connected in a much more easy way. And finally, it would be silly not to recognize that we are able to stream our worship service. So our congregation is not just those of you who are here physically, but those of you who are joining us online. Technology is amazing, and it presents us with both an opportunity, but also a burden. I believe that we are called to be neighbors by all of whom our lives intersect with. So what that means is that if you have a Facebook account, you now have three billion neighbors. That means that if you have an Instagram account, you now have two billion neighbors. Whichever social media platform you find yourself on, it means that there are a whole lot more people in which you are responsible for. So, 
being a neighbor to someone who is a terrible driver can be a really hard thing, right? I know for me, just the other week, I was rear-ended, and it was really hard for me to want to love my neighbor after they just hit my new truck. <laughs> but talking about that, uh, a long time ago, when I lived in Harrisburg, I was, me and Molly were on a midnight stroll. Not midnight, uh, an evening stroll. Uh, it was right after dinner, and there was the river, there was Riverfront Park, and then there's Front Street. And as we were walking, all of a sudden behind us, I hear this screeching of tires. So I quick look, and there is a car that is weaving in and out of traffic. And sure enough, that car hits the curb, and they get a flat tire. And my immediate response was, good, they deserve it. <laughs> but I was, I was struck by this decision that I could go and see if they're okay and help them, or I could keep walking. So I decided, begrudgingly, that I would go check. And then four teenagers dropped, or, or jumped out of the car, and they were all yelling at each other. I later found out they were brothers, and they were all yelling at the driver, and they had no idea what to do. They were saying, maybe we should call the police, but then they were afraid they were going to get in trouble. And it was just their tire that was popped. So I offered to change their tire, and they said, I don't even think we have a tire in this car. And I said, I'm sure you do. So I went into their trunk, found the tire, changed it, and I was happy that I was able to help them. They were happy I was able to help them, and help them, and they said, please come by our family's restaurant. We'll give you a free lunch. Now, as I was walking away, and my hands are covered in brake dust, and I had just lost about an hour of my night, I was conflicted. Because at first, I wanted to feel good. I wanted it to be happily ever after. But I still lost an hour of my night, and my hands were... All, all kinds of nasty. And I never did get that free lunch. But what ended up happening is, in my mind, what changed is they went from being menaces of society, a real danger to everyone, to just a bunch of teenagers who weren't that good at driving. And that sort of made me remember that for the past 20 years, I've been working with teenagers many of which were not good drivers. And it helped me to humanize them. So being a neighbor, for me, meant that it was helping my fellow human because I could and because they needed it. So Heineken is a company that I never thought that I would talk about at a sermon, but I've been here for almost a year, so hopefully you'll bear with me for this next part. About 10 years ago, Heineken, as part of an ad campaign, decided to do a social experiment. And this is where they took about five different pairs of people, and they were pairs that were on polar opposite ends of a certain topic. And they were all of the topics that you can imagine that were especially divisive, like climate change or... Um, sexuality or gender. Now these are people who were on completely opposite sides and they were tasked with building a mystery piece of furniture. They had no idea what that mystery piece of furniture was and they also had no idea who each other was. They had no history. So they walk into the room seeing each other for the first time and they start assembling this mystery piece of furniture. Now, as time went on, light conversation happened. They were super happy to get done with this piece of furniture, which ended up being a bar. Now, in this social experiment, the facilitators then showed them the videos of the interviews that they had previously and privately, where they described their perspective on differing social views. And they saw that they were on opposite ends. After seeing this, the facilitator asked, would you both be willing to sit at the bar that you both just built and have a drink with one another? 
Can you imagine out of those five pairs, how many of them actually stayed? It was all of them. They all decided to stay with each other. Now, I'm not saying that they changed each other's minds, but I believe that they found value in each other and they were able to humanize each other. And I believe that this was possible because they had just worked together, they had just sweat together, and then they broke bread together. In a similar way, there is a documentary coming out just this month where they bring 12 faith leaders together to live for one year in a house and videotape it. Now, I've not seen this film, but I was able to read a bit about from an interview from the producer. And from that interview, a quote stuck out to me that makes me really want to watch this. From a year of living together and these people constantly having discussions about theological theological views, theological conflicts, it's not that, once again, that they all came to some consensus. Actually, it was the gaps they couldn't figure out how to cross had actually bonded them more deeply together than ever before. Their love for one another grew in spite, or maybe because of, deeply held beliefs that they had spent their lives developing. So now this part in my sermon, I get to talk a little bit about my favorite famous Presbyterian, Fred Rogers. So from the 60s to the 2000s, if you had public broadcasting, I guarantee that you would have seen Fred Rogers somewhere. For 40 plus years, he showed us time and time again what it was to be a good neighbor whether he would invite the mailman, Mr. McFeely, who was always in a rush and always anxious. He would invite him in for just a nice conversation or a break. Or when he invited Officer Clemens to come and cool his feet down in the baby pool and talk about life. Or when he got a letter from a concerned little girl who was blind, who was worried that his fish was not being fed because he knew that, or she knew that he had a fish, but she never heard him feed it. So from that point forward, Fred Rogers narrated every time he fed the fish to relieve her anxiety. It seemed that everyone was Fred Rogers' neighbor, and he would do whatever he could to care for his neighbor. I don't ever remember Fred Rogers telling Mr. McFeely that he just needs to calm down. I don't ever remember telling him that he needs to stop being in a rush. But instead, he would offer him a place to rest. He would offer him some friendly conversation. And over the years, that grew into a wonderful friendship. We we live in a fast-moving world that is tremendously connected and growing ever more so. We're called to love our neighbors like the Samaritan man who loved the hurt Jewish man. If you are still wondering who your neighbor is, it is all of God's children. And that means everyone who ever has been and everyone who ever will be. It's the bad drivers. It's that person with an opposing view other than yours. It's the people from other faith traditions. It is even the Eagles fans. And it's even the Steelers fans. And this one's a hard one. It's even the Penn State fans. It is the person next door. It is the person who is halfway around the world. We are all God's children, and there is not a single one of us that is exactly the same. So let us grow closer by seeking understanding instead of uniformity. Let us help where we can without considering the worthiness of those in need. Just as Christ freely freely loves us and gives us the gift of abundant grace, 
by no merit or work of our own, let us attempt to do likewise by spreading this love and grace to all that we encounter. So I'll leave you with a quote by Fred Rogers. My hope is that you will take good care of that part of you where your best dreams come from. That invisible part of you that allows for you to look on yourself and your neighbor with delight. Let's pray. Dear God, we ask that all of our love, all of our kindness, and all of our energy can emanate from us to all of those around and let that love spread as far as it possibly can. And we have faith and we know that you will help spread that love even further. In your name we pray. Amen.